Thank you, John, for that particular assessment. Certainly from my side, um, it's not something we hear every day, particularly coming from a Christian side. So I'm glad to see the objective stance that you have um, taken. Um, if I may just um, suggest there were a few tinkling sounds that I heard, so please put off your cell phones. It should have been something I slipped off my mind at inception, but please put off your mobile phones. We don't want any disturbance any further. And I will now call upon Shabir Ali to address us for 35 minutes. Hello, everyone. Peace be with you and the mercy and blessings of God. Or if I'm to say that in the Arabic language, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, and I thank him for bringing us together tonight in such an amiable atmosphere in which uh, we can reflect together on uh, the very important topic of peace and violence in our current world and uh, the roots uh, or possible roots of uh, peace and violence in uh, our sacred scriptures. Uh, I want to thank uh, the IPCI for uh, bringing me here into South Africa. It is my first trip to this beautiful country. I love it already. There's so much to see and do here. There's uh, so, uh, so much uh, uh, to explore and uh, so much of an opportunity to get close to nature and uh, to even ride one of your big five. I rode an elephant the, the other day. Um, I would also uh, like to thank uh, John Gilchrist for agreeing to share a platform with me. This is uh, the third of our three debates during this uh, lecture tour, and uh, I am uh, really honored uh, to be in, on the same platform with a man of uh, uh, such great learning and uh, the author of so many books, especially books on, on my own religion. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, my brother uh, Yusuf Ismail for such a generous uh, introduction. And uh, I, I thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, the, the topic before us is a very important one. And uh, reflecting on what uh, John has said, I am, in fact, uh, uh, quite uh, surprised at the uh, nature of his presentation. He did indicate to me by email prior to my coming here that he expects that he and I will be much uh, together on the same page uh, with uh, regards to the present topic. I just didn't realize it will be so much uh, on the same page. And John has actually said much of what I might have said if he hadn't said it already. Uh, he has uh, given a fair assessment, I believe, uh, of uh, the kinds of violence that people might perpetrate on behalf of religion, uh, claiming uh, that uh, they are acting on behalf of God, whereas in fact they are not. And uh, he has rightly put before us that this has been done both by Muslims and by Christians, and uh, they continue to be done by both. Uh, of course, uh, he has been uh, more self-critical uh, than uh, critical of, uh, of Muslims, uh, and uh, for that I must commend him. He, that shows uh, a great deal of honesty uh, and straightforwardness, and this, of course, is the manner in which uh, we can proceed to understand each other if uh, we can each, in our own way, be self-critical. As for the Quran's teaching, since that is really the, um, the, the thrust of our topic, what, what does the Quran and the Bible really have to say about peace and violence? Or as the topic puts it, the biblical and Quranic approach to peace and violence. What shall we say about the Quran? In modern times, the Quran has been much misunderstood, I believe. It is often cited by those who are perpetrating violence in the name of Islam. And they cite verses uh, proving that uh, they are fulfilling the Quranic commandment of jihad. So they misunderstand, I believe, certain key passages of the Quran, which I will uh, now hasten to try and explain. At the same time, non-Muslims looking at uh, the activities uh, of, of some Muslims and uh, looking at the verses that are cited in this regard uh, f uh, might be expected to also misunderstand what the Quran is saying. Uh, moreover, there are some who see an opportunity here. Um, some see an opportunity to uh, uh, prove to the world that Islam is wrong. They were trying to prove it by some other means, but now they feel that the political climate is ripe for them to uh, now paint before the world a picture of Islam as being a very violent religion as, at its core. Well, let's look at the Quranic verses then and see what really the Quran teaches about about peace and violence. To understand the Quran, one has to realize that the Quran was not uh, a, a book written by some individual sitting 
at the desk, churning out an entire copy, and then giving it to the printing press. The Quran is a revelation, Muslims believe, given to the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, uh, a piece at a time, over a period of 23 years. Uh, things would happen around him, and parts of the Quran would be revealed, commenting upon what's happening, giving the Prophet and the early Muslims instructions on what to do. So there are instructions about love, and there are instructions about war. But that's because that was the situation at the time. So what were uh, the, the circumstances that gave rise to the mention in the Quran of verses regarding uh, war? The Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, was born in the year 570, according to most historians. He began receiving his revelation in the year 610, when he was about 40 years old. He remained in Mecca, his hometown, for about uh, 13 years following his initial call, and uh, he began preaching his message in Mecca. His message was not received well by his uh, uh, fellow tribespeople. Uh, they felt that his message was a threat to their tribal religion. Uh, they did not uh, like the idea uh, of having one god in contradistinction to the 360 gods that they already had. They did not believe that people could uh, rise from the dead after they had uh, uh, become dust. Uh, th these were difficult beliefs. Moreover, uh, the Islamic call was uh, an egalitarian call. It called uh, for uh, the proper treatment of those who were sidelined, those who were the uh, uh, less fortunate in society, especially the slaves, and uh, uh, we can add the orphans and uh, widows and, and people of uh, low esteem generally in that society. Uh, so the elite did not like the message uh, of Islam, and so they began to persecute the Prophet and his initial followers, especially those followers who were weak uh, and, and who were themselves uh, slaves and, and, and marginalized in society. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom PPs began to receive revelation regarding this situation, and the, the revelations that are in the Quran to, to this day, uh, speaking of this, uh, instruct the Prophet Muhammad and his uh, followers to turn away from uh, these people who are perpetrating violence on them, to uh, just uh, say a word of peace and, and uh, turn away from those who are ignorant, and, and so on. There was nothing in this period uh, regarding taking up arms or even uh, fighting against uh, those who were attacking the Muslims. And one might understand why this was so. Obviously, it would have made no sense for the Muslims to fight at this stage uh, because uh, to, to fight would invite uh, their own destruction. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, uh, bore these tortures and persecutions uh, for many uh, years, uh, a little bit more than a decade, until eventually his, uh, he, uh, or during this period, he began to direct his followers to migrate elsewhere so that they could safely practice their religion in peace. Some of his followers migrated to Abyssinia, uh, where they lived uh, under the auspices uh, of a Christian king. Some more went in a second wave to Abyssinia. The Prophet Muhammad, himself uh, came to a, a, a situation in his life where uh, it was expedient for him to migrate. He migrated to Medina when the, his non-Muslim opponents uh, ev made a plot against his life. Uh, the story that is found in some of the biographical works uh, say that the Prophet Muhammad uh, was uh, 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 the Prophet Muhammad escaped during the night while he had uh, left his cousin uh, Ali uh, to sleep in his bed so that the spies would think that that he is still in town, while in fact he had made his way to safety. They pursued him uh, during this hijra or migration, but the Prophet nevertheless uh, escaped uh, unscathed uh, on that occasion, and he arrived in Medina where he could safely live and practice his faith. But not for long. Uh, the historians uh, tell us that uh, the non-Muslim armies came uh, to attack the Prophet Muhammad and the early Muslims in, in Medina. Uh, wave after wave. Uh, so the Prophet Muhammad usually would come out to meet them at certain junctures. So there was the Battle of Badr. The Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace had migrated in the year 622 uh, and uh, the following year, 623, is when the Battle of Badr was fought. If one looks at a map, one will see uh, Mecca down below, that's the hometown of the Prophet Muhammad. One would see Medina above, where the Prophet had migrated to, and close to Medina uh, the position of Badr, where the 
that first uh, major battle is fought. So you can get the sense that an army marched all the way from down here, going some 400 kilometers to the north to attack the prophet's city, and the prophet just simply comes out to meet them at a convenient point, rather than allow them to enter the city and ravish uh, the city. Uh, that would, uh, in, in Muslim counting now, be the first year of the Hijra. So instead of saying 623, uh, let me say uh, the, the first uh, year after uh, the Hijra or the second year of the, of the Hijra. Now, the third year, uh, th that is a year after the Battle of Badr, uh, the non-Muslim army came to attack the Muslims again. And this time the Prophet went out to meet them at Uhud, which uh, on a small map would be indistinguishable. It would be the same dot as uh, the dot for Medina, the Prophet's city. Today, to this day, when Muslims go to perform the pilgrimage in Mecca, uh, they uh, would go to the uh, site of the Battle of Uhud, uh, to pray to God to bless uh, the martyrs, those Muslims who had died in that particular battle as they were defending the city from uh, being invaded. Uh, the uncle of the prophet, Hamza, died on this uh, important occasion. Some 70 uh, Muslims uh, died in this defensive uh, battle. In the fifth year, the non-Muslims formed such a huge allied force that it was, was apparent that the Muslims would be decimated once and for all. The Prophet uh, practiced a defensive measure by building, a, or rather digging, a ditch on the northern pass uh, towards Medina, uh, so, because that was the expected uh, uh, pass through which uh, the non-Muslim army would invade. Uh, having dug that uh, ditch, or trench, uh, the uh, Prophet and his people were able to stay safely behind it because when the non-Muslim armies came, uh, the Allied forces uh, reached the ditch and uh, they could not cross. Uh, the horses would resist uh, any further uh, move. They camped there for a couple of weeks until eventually the um, elements were too much for them, uh, the wind uh, and the sun and the blowing sand, uh, they eventually dispersed. So that was the fifth year of the, of the Hijra. On, in the sixth year... The Prophet Muhammad uh, took his followers on a pilgrimage to Mecca. They were in pilgrim's garb, uh, and uh, they were obviously with peaceful intent. They wanted to uh, re-enter the city from which the Prophet Muhammad had been driven out, and uh, just simply to perform the pilgrimage to the sacred house, the house which uh, Muslims believe uh, was initially um, set up by the Prophet Abraham and his son Ishmael for the worship of the one God. Uh, it was the custom at the time that people from all over Arabia would come to perform their worship services at that temple. Uh, why would the Prophet not be allowed? He should be allowed. But the non-Muslims uh, non who controlled that city uh, refused entry to the Prophet and his people. Uh, some of his people wanted to fight back, wanted to fight their way into the city because they felt it is their God-given right, as it is the right of anyone, to enter the city peacefully and worship. Why should they be prevented? Uh, after all, they have the truth. So why should they uh, just accept the sanction of these non-Muslims who do not believe in God and who worship idols, something that both the Bible and the Quran condemned? But the Prophet Muhammad, to whom be peace, uh, uh, cautioned them to remain uh, patient. And he himself signed a treaty with the non-Muslims uh, that indicated several stipulations which were uh, unfavorable to Muslims. Uh, for example, uh, the, one of the stipulations was that uh, if any uh, of the Quraysh people, the non-Muslims, were to uh, embrace Islam and hence go to join the Muslim community in Medina, if his family were to demand him, uh, he would have to be returned to the non-Muslim side. Whereas, in fact, if any of the Muslims were to go and join the Quraysh people, he would not be returned. Uh, One-sided stipulations like this were very difficult for the Muslims to swallow. But uh, what was in favor uh, of the Muslim situation was that this treaty would entail ten years of peace to follow. Eventually, that uh, treaty would be broken, as Muslims understood, from the non-Muslim side. Uh, but in, in the months that followed, in, in the 17 months in which this treaty remained in place, Muslims could see the effects and the benefits of such a treaty. In fact, uh, the Quran referred to this treaty as a fatah, 
as a victory. Surah 48 in the Quran, and this is the point, uh, this is the reason I am mentioning uh, this whole history, so you can see what the verses of the Quran are dealing, are dealing with. Surah 48 of the Quran is entitled Surah Al-Fatih, the chapter of the victory. It begins by saying, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. We have given you a clear victory. Commentators on the Quran generally say that the victory that is being spoken about in this passage is the treaty itself. Now that is a rather strange way of referring to a treaty. Usually a, an army goes and conquers another army and comes out victorious. That is referred to as victory. But uh, where is the victory in signing a peace treaty? Today we know the benefits of a win-win situation. Both sides come out winners. In the case of this treaty, the Quran referred to the treaty as a victory. And it, the Muslims eventually came to see what was a victory in this because they said that in the 17 months following the treaty, more people had embraced the religion of Islam than in the 17 years prior to the treaty, during the uh, mission of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now what difference does peace make? Uh, peace makes a lot of difference from the point of view of one who wants to convey a message to others. If you're an, ambas an ambassador for any, uh, 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 any cause or any idea, you need to reach people when they are at peace with you. If people are at war with you, they do not uh, listen to what you have to say. Uh, in fact, they come to you with closed minds. Uh, the fight or flight mechanism comes. Uh, uh, kicks in. Either they fight you or they flee from you. But uh, in, in peacetime, they will listen to you. They will interact. And this, of course, was uh, the benefit of having this peace treaty. We can see then that during this uh, period of time, the, 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 over the six years that I've just uh, described before you, uh, and, and the major battles that have taken place uh, here, you can understand now the verses of the Quran that speak to these various circumstances and occasions. Uh, the Surah 33 in the Quran is referred to as uh, Surah Al-Ahzab, the chapter about the Allies. And that is because it reflects on the fact that these allied forces had come to attack the Muslims in this battle which comes to be known as the Battle of the Allies and alternatively is also called the Battle of the Trench, uh, Khandak, because uh, the Muslims had dug that trench, that ditch I spoke about, to stave off the enemy uh, from entering their city. What were the Muslims to do after they had migrated away from Mecca, the few Muslims who did along with the Prophet, peace be upon him, and went up to take safe haven in, in Medina? Remember, the Prophet was born in Mecca, he was driven out, and he now lives safely uh, at, at, and at peace in, in Medina. What was he to do and his followers to do when they are now being attacked? This was a new question. And the Quran seems to speak about this in Surah 22, verse, verses number 39 to 40. Zulimu. Permission is given to the Muslims to fight back because they have been oppressed. Those who have been driven out of their homes without justice uh, simply because they said, Our Lord is God. Uh, if it had not been for the fact that God used some people to drive back some others, uh, the, the churches, the synagogues, the monasteries, and the mosques in which the name of Allah is being recited much would have been destroyed. Here the Quran is speaking about a real situation in the time of the Prophet Muhammad on peace, where there was no uh, religious freedom as we have it now, uh, in, in which we, a situation there in which uh, the, the non-Muslims were interested in decimating the Muslim population, demolishing whatever mosques there were, and it, in fact such an attitude does not restrict itself to demolishing mosques. Such an attitude would prompt people to demolish churches and synagogues and monasteries as well. And it is interesting that the verse of the Quran that speaks about this says that uh, God uses some people to drive back some others, to defend against the attacks of some others, because if that were not the case, the others would demolish the churches and synagogues and monasteries and mosques. This verse seems to indicate that Muslims need to defend not only their mosques, but also the churches and synagogues and monasteries. This in the Quran is one of the justifications of war, to defend the sanctuaries 
and the places of worship, not only of the Muslim faith, but of all faiths. So the, the, the verse began by speaking of permission being granted to the Muslims. This is not a command to go and fight. This is a permission uh, for the Muslims to defend themselves against their attackers. Rules now come to be drawn up for war. And they are mentioned in the Quran. For example, in Surah 2, verse uh, 190 and forward from that. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا And fight in the way of God against those who fight you, but do not transgress or do not be aggressive. In Allah لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Certainly God does not like those who are aggressive or those who transgress. So uh, th there is a stipulation here that the Muslims are to fight those who are fighting against them. But they are not to be aggressive or, uh, or transgressing uh, in uh, such a situation as well. So we see then that the Quran uh, ultimately has a peaceful outlook. Peace is really the basis of what the Quran is establishing. That was preached during the Meccan period for about 13 years until the Prophet migrated. And now the new situation of the Muslims is that they do have some ability, they do have some power, they can finally rise in their defense. And now the, their personal obligation and the obligation to their fellow citizens is in fact to rise in defense. But that cannot change the uh, modus operandi, the basic principle of the Islamic faith, that it is about peace, and you turn away from the ignorant, you move away from the scene of violence, you work towards peace, you live for peace, but now what are you to do when you are being attacked? Permission is given for you to defend yourselves. Muslim commentators on the Quran, unfortunately, have often uh, thought of the Quranic verses as canceling each other. They subscribe to a doctrine known as Naskh, in which they said that certain verses of the Quran cancel some other verses. So that whereas we're reading the Quran and we're finding the verses that speak about peace and being at uh, calm with the enemy and turning away from violence and saying a word of peace and turning away from the ignorant and so on, they would say that the verses which speak about uh, engaging in war cancel all of the previous verses, all of those verses from the Meccan period. Other scholars think that uh, the doctrine of, of Nasq has been much uh, exaggerated beyond reasonable proportion. Uh, several scholars from the uh, classical and medieval period have tried to mitigate uh, the, the number of verses which have been cited as uh, abrogating and abrogated verses, especially the abrogated verses. Uh, so that uh, some scholars had said that some, uh, as many as 400 verses had been abrogated in this way, which means that there will be some 400 verses in the Quran. As you're reading them, you have to have in mind, these don't apply, these don't apply, these don't apply. But uh, Imam al-Sayyuti, rahimahullah, uh, from the 15th century, uh, in his book, al Khan fi Ulum al-Quran, had uh, narrowed down the list to only 21 verses. And Shah Waliullah of Delhi, the late 17th century scholar of international fame, uh, has uh, in his book Al Fawzul Kabir fi Tafsir, um, has uh, narrowed down uh, the list to only four verses. John Burton from the University of Edinburgh has uh, studied the arguments in detail, and uh, and he thinks that uh, none of these verses actually. Uh, can be held up as, as being abrogating verses or abrogated verses according to the way in which the classical doctrine was put forward. Uh, Yasser Qadi, in his book, uh, Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran, suggests that what we should speak about instead is not naskh or, or abrogation, but taqsis or specification, which means that uh, a certain verse speaks about a certain situation and it is specific to that situation. It may apply again to any other situation that is similar enough to the initial situation. But then there will be other verses that speak to other situations. So each verse is uh, specific to its type of situation. So no verse cancels each other. The situation changes, so one verse applies to one situation, and the situation changes, and there's, a, there's a, another verse that applies to the new and changed situation. So now in reading the Quran, we can have in our minds that all of the verses apply, but each to its particular type of situation. If that situation arises, 
that's the verse to apply. If the other situation arises, that's the verse to apply. And in this way, the Quran remains informative and applicable until the day of judgment according to the situations that arise. There is a verse to speak to each and every situation. The Muslim just has to be clear on which verse applies when. So now, when in, in, when in normal circumstances, and nobody's attacking Muslims, obviously uh, the, the, the verses about peace apply. That is the basic beginning uh, point for Muslim thinking about what to do. And if, on the other hand, Muslims are being attacked, they have the permission in the Quran to defend themselves and to defend their community. So in this way, we make sense of the entire uh, spectrum of Quranic verses. Let me continue. We spoke of, uh, of the events leading up until the sixth year, and then we said that the treaty was signed, and 17 months later, the treaty was broken. The Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, after that treaty was broken, seized the opportunity to march back into his hometown. By this time, he had a, a significantly large amount of followers, and he was able to enter, uh, re-enter his hometown and to take over the town uh, in a virtually bloodless uh, re-entry. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, had the opportunity here to slaughter his enemies. And it was apparently expected in his day that this is what he would do. But he declared to his people, I give you the word of forgiveness, just like Joseph, whom we know from the Bible in the book of Genesis, uh, Joseph uh, forgave his brothers who had uh, plotted to kill him previously. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, I say to you the same thing that Joseph said to his brothers, La tathriba alaykum al yawm. There should be no blame on you this day. So he declared a general amnesty for, for the people at that time. So he was not entering as the types of conqueror that we would know at the time, but he was entering as a peaceful man of God. He bowed his head according to the reports, and he circumambulated the Kaaba, uh, the sacred house of worship, from which he had been previously prevented uh, to enter. In the ninth year, the year following this, uh, the Prophet uh, sent uh, Abu Bakr uh, to lead the delegation uh, of Muslims to now perform the pilgrimage and uh, Ali along with them to proclaim some verses of the Quran which had now recently been revealed. These are the verses which incidentally are also found in the ninth chapter uh, of the Quran. Surah 9 verse number 5 is often quoted nowadays uh, and it seems shocking if it is quoted out of context. It seems to say, kill them wherever you find them. In fact, it literally says so. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ سَخِفْتُمُوهُمْ Kill them wherever you find them. Uh, but in fact, when one reads it in the context of the page in which it is written, in the surah in which it occurs, and one looks at it within the history of, of where it came to be revealed and when it was given as an instruction, uh, one can make sense of it and see how that fits the peaceful uh, purposes of the Islamic faith. Uh, the previous year, the Prophet, peace be upon him, by taking over uh, the center of Quraysh power in Mecca, had virtually established peace throughout the entire land of Hijaz. But there were some guerrilla fighters. There were some who were still out to attack and kill Muslims, ambushing Muslims and seizing them by, by Rus and killing them. So what were the Muslims to do in that situation? This chapter of the Quran, at least the beginning passages up to number five, is basically saying to Muslims that they will have the opportunity to respond in kind to these people who are attacking them and ambushing them and killing them. In fact, it was a general proclamation, a warning. And it, this warning was delivered uh, on the day of the Hajj, that is the largest gathering of, of people in the area. This is almost like the equivalent of announcing it on television today to make sure that everyone in every household knows what the rules are. The rules are simply this. You have four months of respite. There are four months in which you will be safe. And these are probably the four months which are mentioned in the Quran as the sacred months in which Muslims are prohibited from fighting. So one cannot say that Islam will allow him or her to fight unconditionally because there are four months in the year in which the fighting would be absolutely prohibited. But the Quran is saying to these guerrilla fighters that if you continue attacking the Muslims, then the Muslims will have the opportunity outside of these four months to attack you before you attack them and to kill you before you kill them. 
and the Quran makes exceptions for those who might be attacked because the Quran says that if they repent and they change their ways then khallu you are to leave their way alone you are not the muslims would have no authority to attack such persons moreover the following verse verse number 6 of the same chapter says that if one of these uh, polytheists were to seek refuge with you, remember the polytheists are at war with the Muslim monotheists, but the Quran says if one of these polytheists were to seek refuge with you, فَأَجِرْهُ Then give him refuge, حَتَّى يَسْمَعْ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ So that he may hear the words of God, ثُمَّ أَبْلِغُ مَأْمَنَ Then transport him to his place of safety. Transport him to a place where he will be safe. So you understand the situation. Those who are at war with the Muslims might, for whatever reason, seek refuge with the Muslim community. In that case, the Muslims are instructed here, give him refuge. So that he may hear the words of God. And then, at the end of all of this, you are to transport him to some place where he will be safe. Now to me, this all fits the general pattern that we already know from the Meccan surahs. The general outlook is peace. In a situation where the Muslims are being attacked, they have the opportunity to defend themselves. But in rising in such a defense, they do not have the permission uh, to, uh, be, to be aggressive in warfare, but rather they might uh, fight only to the extent that is necessary. And in that situation in which the non-Muslims were attacking the Muslims in this guerrilla warfare, ambushing and killing Muslims, Muslims Muslims would have the opportunity uh, to defend themselves and even in that situation to take the preemptive measure of killing rather than waiting to uh, be killed. Of course, that is only after the rules are made known, it is, there is a public declaration and everyone knows what the rules are and there is an opportunity for the aggressors to seize their aggression in which case Muslims would have no right uh, to harm them in any way. Now for the remaining few minutes in my presentation, I want to turn to the other side and pay attention to the fact that uh, uh, John had uh, already put before us the problem of certain passages in Joshua, for example, where the extermination of the Canaanites uh, is being spoken about. I'd like to introduce you to a few pieces of writing uh, that um, uh, deal with, with this sort of problem. There's a book entitled Show Them No Mercy, which is a uh, compilation of uh, writings from um, what to do with those verses. The back cover is, I think, uh, highly instructive. It says, September 11, 2001 brought us face to face with the stark reality of jihad. But holy war is neither new nor the invention of Islam. The Old Testament writings record what amounts to Canaanite genocide in the name of Yahweh. How do we reconcile this with the teachings of Jesus who commands us to love our enemies and overcome evil with good? Uh, that, that's one resource. It's written or, or the, ed, edited by Stanley Gundry. Uh, this is entitled God is a Warrior by uh, Tremper Longman III and Daniel Reed. It, it looks at the Old Testament uh, and the way in which it depicts Yahweh as a warrior, especially cha Exodus chapter 15 verse 3, which says Yahweh is a man of war. God is a man of war. And it goes into the New Testament as well to see how Jesus, especially in the book of Revelation, is depicted as in some way continuing that uh, warrior motif um, that was already established from the Old Testament. Uh, this is a book entitled What the Bible Really Says. It is in some way uh, critical of, um, uh, of the Bible. It, it uses historical critical methods. And for that reason, uh, some Christians may find some parts of this offensive. But I think that uh, the, the uh, essay by Robert Carroll dealing with war is highly instructive and informative for our present uh, circumstance. I'd like to just look at one, uh, um, one aspect of what Robert Carroll uh, has put before us. He talks about why the, uh, the, the presentation of Jesus in the New Testament and the general outlook of the New Testament is peaceful uh, in contradistinction and in sharp contrast to what we already know from the Old Testament and God's dealing with the Canaanites and others. Uh, he says, uh, having neither homeland to defend nor political interests to advance at a communal level, the early Christian churches had little need for war strategy. Uh, he's looking at the real situation, the, uh, what German scholars would call
called the the Zitz in Leban, the situation in which the Christian documents were written. That was a situation of Roman domination, and the Christians did not dare to raise a voice against Rome. But on the other hand, we can see in 1 Peter and in Romans 13 that there is a capitulation to Roman authority. There is a a, a recommendation for Christians to just simply submit to the authorities because, after all, these are authorities which these writings say were were put in in place by God and they should be respected by Christians. Of course, that would mean uh, respecting authorities who commit injustice, who are, in fact, uh, torturing and persecuting uh, Christians for the very fact that they had the the right belief at the time. Uh, This um, is a book entitled War and Peace in the uh, World Religions, uh, edited by Perry Schmidt. Uh, local, and uh, the uh, article on Islam by Lloyd uh, Ridgeon is very instructive because he goes into the history of the compilation of uh, of the Islamic Sira works, so the, the lives of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, and he shows how these works have been compiled by people who had this kind of battle mentality, and they painted the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace in a similar picture. But in order to understand what the Quran really says, one has to be able to see past the Sira works, to use the the instruction material there for providing a context for the Quranic uh, revelation, but at the same time, one has to be able to look at the Quranic text directly and to see what precisely they say about peace and war. Uh, I'll leave you with this, uh, and uh, I would be very interested to get the responses. Thank you very much.